This week's talk was inspired by an exhibition at the Royal Academy on Revolutionary Art in Russia from 1917 to 1932. And I've just extended the period back to 1890 because I wanted to talk about the, the background to the revolutionary period of Russian art. And um, as you may know, uh, as a bit of background, Russia is by far the largest country in the world, nearly double the size of um, the next biggest countries, Canada, America and China, and it extends over 11 time stones. It's relatively thinly populated, although as it's so large, it does actually have the largest population of um, any European country. It has vast forests, which is relevant to the art. In fact, they're the largest area of forest of any country on the planet. It has a more than a fifth of all the trees in the world. Now, historically, it was ruled by the Mongols from the 13th century until they were defeated by Ivan the Great in 1480. And that, to put it in context, is just before Columbus discovered America, and it's just before the Tudor period started at the Battle of Bosworth, 1485. Now, the um, notorious Ivan the Terrible became the first, first Tsar of all Russia in 1547, which is the year that our Henry VIII died, just to put that into context. And the reign of the Tsars lasted for another 370 years until Nicholas II abdicated in 1917. Incidentally, this picture you're looking at of um, Ivan the Terrible is a, a wasn't painted at the period. We've we've only got a few um, ideas of what he looked like. It's um, painted during the period that I'm talking about today, uh, painted by um, Viktor Vaznetsov, and um, I'll talk more about um, him later. A bit more background, Moscow was the original capital of Russia, but from the beginning of the 18th century, I think 1703, it was St. Petersburg. And then again, Russia from 1918 onwards. From 1757, so just after the, mid, the, the middle of the 18th century, Russian art was controlled by what was originally called the St. Petersburg Academy of Art. And then it was renamed a few years later, the Imperial Academy of Art. And um, it was renamed when this building was commissioned in 1789. It wasn't the earliest national academy. I mean, the French Academy is more than 100 years previously. It was 1648. But it was founded in 11 years before our Royal Academy and um, had a much more prestigious building than the original building for our Royal Academy. It was in effect a government department that controlled art throughout Russia uh, for over a hundred years, but by roughly the 1870s, the new uh, merchant millionaire class in Moscow were creating a, um, a, a demand for um, modern art that wasn't supported or taught at the Imperial Academy. And this chap was the leading art patron of this new group of business people, Sava Mamontov. He was a Russian railway tycoon and he surrounded himself with um, avant-garde artists of all sorts, um, composers, painters, singers, architects, writers, actors, and so on. And the, he created what was called the Mamontov Circle and the aim was to create a new progressive modern Russian art and culture. And he created a, an artist colony that included most of the best Russian artists at the beginning, the modern artists at the beginning of the 20th century. Now their aim was to recreate the spirit of medieval Russian art, which might sound a bit contradictory for a modern art movement, but think about um, the pre-Raphaelites 
who remember were inspired by the art before Raphael to produce a new revolutionary art style. Later, Mamontov was financially ruined and he, he died in 1918 after a long illness. This painting is from the, the Moscow period of Mikhail Vrubel. And he, he was a brilliant student at the Academy, but he was heavily criticized by the Academy for paintings in this style, but he was supported by Mamontov and, um, and other patrons. So there was a breakaway group, in other words, the beginnings of modern art in Russia. And later, you can see elements of it in this painting, actually, if you look closely, but later Vrubel started breaking forms down into cubes and, and linear planes, as you see here. And his work was influential on the young Pablo Picasso, who called him a genius. And so it may, maybe it's one of the elements that was um, uh, influential on the development of Cubism. Unfortunately, Vrubel's mental health started to deteriorate and then he lost his sight. And after a few years distraught by not being able to paint, he stood by an open window in St. Petersburg in the winter, well, in fact, it was in April and died of pneumonia a week later. This is um, a work by Ivan Kramsky and it's a portrait of the painter Ivan Shushkin. And we, if you look at the date, 1873, I've gone back a generation just to put a bit more of the background in. Uh, now, Kramsky was a leader of a breakaway group of 14 artists who left the Academy and they rejected the history painting which was regarded as the highest form of painting that was taught at the academy as they thought it was irrelevant for um, the, the ordinary people. And they refused, in fact, to paint a history painting which was required by the academy for its annual competition. And they left. And it was known as the Revolt of 14, and they called themselves the Wanderers, Perodishniki. And their aim was to travel around Russia and paint what they saw. The subject matter was what they saw in Russia, the Russian villages, village life, Russian landscape, rather than the classical works taught by the Academy, history paintings. Now, one of the leading landscape painters of this group was the one who is portrayed here, Ivan Shushkin, and we'll see his work next. But um, Kramsky formed a, another group, the Artel, which means cooperative of artists. It was a democratically minded group of artists who thought the regimented training of the academy was irrelevant. Uh, another breakaway group, uh, similar, as I've already said, to the pre-Raphaelites breaking away from the stranglehold of the Royal Academy, and also, in a way, the Impressionists breaking away from the French Academy of Arts. So, Ivan Shushkin. This is his most famous work. It's very famous in Russia, Morning in a Pine Forest. He was one of the most popular landscape artists in Russia and became known as Tsar of the Woods. And this is a, a typical of his work. It was... Um, like, like a lot of his works, a song of praise for Mother Russia is a way of looking at it. It became very popular and was reproduced. Let me give you an example of the one of the consumer goods, which included a range of um, chocolate bars called the Clumsy Bear. And you can see the work uh, used on the packaging of the bears. And it, it's still, I believe, on sale today in Russia. And, and his work is still popular today in Russia. <clears throat> In fact, according to one poll, this particular painting is the second most popular painting in Russia. The, um, the most popular, well, I won't go off into the most popular, but it's of three Russian, uh, what they call bogaties, uh, knights, like knights of the round table, medieval knights, heroes, the word means as well in Russia. 
Now, there was a little bit of, just, just to explain a bit of the background, there was um, some confusion. It was a, this painting was originally signed by Konstantin Savitsky, and he, I believe, painted the bears. He just painted the bears and signed the painting. But later, an art dealer uh, who did some research into it removed his signature, and it's now regarded as entirely by Shushkin. And as I said, it's typical and a lot of his works, they don't always include bears, but they often, they emphasize the vastness and the intern, eternal quality of the Russian forests. And he often like this shows close ups where the tops of the trees are, are cut off so as to immerse us as though we were inside the forest and the beauty and, and the wildness of the forest. Now, increasingly through the 1880s, the, the Wanderers, that group I mentioned who broke away, the, um, the group of 14, lost their status as progressive. They became a close-knit society. They were even invited to rejoin the Imperial Academy. And young artists were increasingly by then turning to the West for inspiration. And the Wanderers restricted their membership and became institutionalized. Uh, I, I mention this because later Soviet um, historians and critics have recast them as the precursors of socialist realism that we'll come on to later. Um, so it, it, was, it wasn't what they originally were. They originally revolutionaries breaking away from um, those um, institutional forms of art. This is um, Valentin Serov. And this is his most famous painting, Girl with Peaches. And it has been described as his greatest work and a, um, the masterpiece of Russian painting is another, another quote. Now, Serov was the leader of um, what we might call a semi-impressionist style of painting. He was born in St. Petersburg. His parents were composers, they were both composers, and he was encouraged in his art. He studied in Moscow and then in Paris, and his earliest works concentrate on light and colour and this fresh uh, picturesque perception of the world. And he's often seen as an early Russian Impressionist, although it's interesting that at the time he painted this, he wasn't aware of French Impressionism and his style uh, is derived from, he deeply studied Franz Howells, and Diego Velasquez. The painting is full of light. He's captured the freshness and quality of light as it streams in behind the sitter. It's a complex um, uh, manipulation of light. It's a, it's a contre jour painting or against the light composition. And he's using the light to create um, an aura or glow around the sitter. And the sitter is um, uh, Vera Mamontova, the 11 year old daughter of the millionaire I mentioned, Sava Mamontov. Uh, incidentally, Mamontova is the female form of Mamontov. Uh, Serov, um, I'll give you a quote. All I wanted was freshness, that special freshness that you can always feel in real life. And I don't see in paintings. I painted it for over a month and tortured her poor child to death because I wanted to preserve the freshness in the finished painting, as you can see in old works by great masters. So there's a number of um, elements to that quote, which uh, bear on things that I've been saying. Another painting by Serov uh, was, um, and, and increasingly he took on important commissions. So you see here, uh, there's a portrait of um, Princess Olga Orlova. Uh, he painted um, another princess and also Grand Dukes. He married in 1889 and his wife and children were often the um, subject of his paintings. He taught at the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture and Architecture, and he was um, a great influence on the next generation of Russian artists. And his work is today regarded as the, the greatest work of Russian realistic art. He, it's a bit difficult to explain how important 
he is regarded to oh, well, one example, there was a major exhibition of his work in 2016 and crowds queued round the block in sub-zero temperatures. And in fact, on the day that Vladimir Putin visited the exhibition, the crowds were so great, they pushed down the doors of the museum. The Minister of Culture ordered the gallery to stay open and provided porridge and hot tea to the people in the queue. That's how popular he was, 400,000 people attended. The temperatures were minus 10 and it was snowing. And this work, the, the work we saw previously, Girl with Peaches, was in the exhibition. And so a lot of people went to see that. It's a bit like, um, I don't know how to, it, it, it'd be a bit like someone, John Singer Sargent, but with, with the, the fame of a, a Turner or a constable. But moving on to um, more, um, if you like, modern art, Natalia Goncharova. She was one of the most important early artists. She founded a group called Jack of Diamonds, and that became one of the most influential group of avant-garde artists in Russia between about 1910 and 1917. Their first exhibition was in 1910 and they invited French cubists to uh, exhibit. Uh, Vasily Kandinsky uh, exhibited, he was living in Germany at the time, and Goncharova and her artists were influenced by artists like um, Paul Cezanne, Henri Matisse, as well as Russian artists like Kazimir Malevich, who I'll talk about later. Now, Goncharova was a member of the avant-garde group De Blau Reiter, the Blue Rider, which I'll talk about later as well. And she didn't stay in the, remember I said she founded Jack of Diamonds. She only stayed with that group a year because she thought that the, the group of artists was becoming over-reliant on French art and with her lifelong partner, Mikhail Larionov, they, or she mostly invented rayonism, which you see on the right here. It was one of the first Russian abstract movements to be entirely um, Russian based. It predated the abstract work of people like um, Vasily Kandinsky, Piet Mondrian, Kazimir Malevich, and she, developed rayonism after hearing or inspired by a series of lectures about futurism by the founder Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, which were held in Moscow. Now the futurists took speed, technology, modernity as their inspiration, but the rayonists sought art that sort of floated beyond abstraction outside time and space, they said, and they wanted to break the barriers between art and the public. The name rayonism comes from their use of dynamic rays of contrasting colour reflecting or, or representing the reflections from objects. In a sense, whereas cubism breaks down forms into geometric shapes, rayonism breaks down the overall appearance into just rays of light. And in their literature, the rayonists um, talk about their art as encompassing all existing styles and forms of the art of the past. Now, Goncharova continued to be very influential. In 1913, you see on the left here, she walked through the streets of Moscow together with fellow artists with symbols on their faces like this, and she would walk topless with symbols painted on her chest through Moscow. It was perhaps the first performance art ever staged. And it, she used it to create publicity for the forthcoming exhibition. But she didn't actually need publicity. She was already very well known. She'd been charged with obscenity, had her paintings confiscated. And just a, a, a quote from her, the authorities think a woman artist should not paint the female nude so explicitly. And in the exhibition, there was an astonishing 800 works in the exhibition. It, it was an astounding success. It captivated Russian society. It influenced Sergei Diaghilev. 
and he commissioned her to work on costumes and backdrops for his ballet russe. She moved to Paris in 1921 and lived there for the rest of her life. Uh, she found, uh, as we will hear later, the environment in Russia for artists in 1921 was becoming too restrictive. So she moved to Paris. She became a key figure in Paris and at the city's cutting edge art scene, she became famous for her Cubo futurist style, which you see on the right here in her work called Cyclist. It was, it's got elements of cubism and elements, I, I, I think on balance, it's probably more futurist than cubist, but it's called Cubo futurist. She taught American artists in Paris and through that her fame spread across America. She started to sell works in Chicago and New York. Her artistic output, she was a very hard worker. Her artistic output was immense, very wide ranging and, and nearly always controversial. And the changes in Russia during the 1920s, particularly when Stalin take, took over, meant it was impossible for her to return to Russia in any way and she remained in Paris. Um, she created paintings, sculptures, a religious series. She refused to let gender define her artistic approach. She produced stage sets. She illustrated socialist newspapers, designed dresses and so on. Uh, I, I try to find out what the words mean. Um, I, I don't speak Russian, but the I, I looked it up. The sign behind the cyclist directly behind pronounced shalk means silk and on the right schlapa it's the first part first three letters you can see there that look like a, a dub i don't know a w and n and a backwards r um, are the first three letters of the word hat so i think behind him it says silk hat and i don't know what the um, h backwards n t means it's pronounced neat and th that means knit, but I don't think that's, it's the first three letters of the word that means thread, but I, I don't see the significance of that. So it's, maybe it's three random letters, but uh, let's move on. Vasily Kandinsky is one of the great Russian avant-garde artists who, who um, his name is well known in the West. He's one of the um, three or four or five artists credited with creating abstract art, as, as we've seen. Goncharova also had a claim, and as we've seen in a previous talk, the Swedish artist Hilma Afklint also had um, perhaps an even stronger claim to um, being the first to create abstract art. Now, Kandinsky was born in Moscow, and he studied to become a lawyer. In fact, he became professor in law and economics in Moscow. And it wasn't until he was 30 when he attended an exhibition in Moscow and saw a painting by Monet of Haystacks. You probably know his Haystacks series. And he, he was befuddled, I think. He couldn't recognize what it was. And this disturbed him, particularly, as he said, he couldn't erase the image from his mind, but he couldn't identify it. In his words, painting took on a fairy tale power and splendor. As a result, he gave up his career as a professor in law and moved to Munich to study art. And he moved there in 1896 and didn't return to Moscow till 1814, the outbreak of the First World War, when it would be a, a good time for the Russians to leave Germany. And in 1911, when he was in Germany, he formed the Blue Rider or Blau, the, Der Blau Reiter group with August Mackey, Franz Mark, and um, Natalia Goncharova. Now, and, and this is really the painting that gave rise to the name of the group, the Blue Rider. After the revolution, he returned to Russia and worked for the cultural administration, but um, Eventually, within a few years, his spiritual outlook conflicted with the materialism of Soviet 
society and he returned to Germany in 1920, taught at the Bauhaus until the Nazis closed it in 1933 when he moved to France, became a French citizen in 1939, uh, where he produced some of his most significant art and died in France in 1944. But let's look at a few more of his works. Uh, you've seen this one before, I know. And his early work, was representational, like a lot of abstract artists, that's the way they started. He was influenced by the spiritual philosophy called theosophy that was very popular at this time. And theosophy taught its uh, followers that creation is a geometric progression that starts with a single point and evolves and blossoms out from that point. And he wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual in Art in 1910, and his work gradually became more abstract. And within a few years, by 1915, as we'll see in a moment, any reference to material objects has gone. And this, I think, is an um, interesting halfway point on that journey. In this painting, there are still elements we can recognize, reinforced by the title, the Cossacks on the right can be seen, and on the right behind them, there's what could be a castle, there's a rainbow in the center and what appears to be birds at the top flying above the castle-like structure. But he wanted to produce an object-free, spiritually deep pictures that suggested he was inspired by music. And let me give you a quote. Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. So that's what he was inspired by. And this is the sort of abstract art that um, an example that he, he moved on to. This is called yellow blue, sorry, yellow red blue. Um, in 1925. And I said he returned to Moscow and stayed till after the revolution. And in Moscow, it was in Moscow that his work became completely abstract. And the, the titles become abstract as well. Well, in other words, they don't name a subject. He married in 1917. He became involved, as I said, in the politics in Russia during and after the revolution. He collaborated in art education, museum reform enthusiastically because he believed like many avant-garde artists that he could completely revolutionize art and make it relevant to the people so he was inspired by the revolution and sought to introduce a revolutionary art that he thought would help to change society he taught ideas of form and color and at this time did little painting when he was teaching in moscow and became the first director of the Institute of Artistic Culture in Moscow. Uh, but, but his spiritual and expressionistic views of art was ultimately rejected by the radical members of the Institute. Um, and he was regarded as too individualistic, too bourgeois. And in 1921, he was invited to go to Germany. As I said, he went to the Bauhaus, which was um, then in Weimar. Um, he was invited by the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, and he stayed and taught there. A final work by Kandinsky called Swinging, the shapes and colors suggest movement and music, uh, which at this time would have been jazz, 1925. This work is at the Tate, uh, although it's not on display at the moment, it's on loan to China at the moment, it's in Shanghai. Uh, but I, I used to take people around the Tate and this was one of the works I would talk about. And many people, I, I talked to them about abstraction and many people I talked to saw it. I, I don't know whether you can, if you, they saw it as um, a realistic or semi-realistic depiction of a person sitting in a chair being stabbed by knives. Uh, 
I can see, I don't know whether you can, but I can see what they mean, but I, I can assure you it's intended to be entirely abstract. The, I think that's the human brain will always, even in abstract work, start to see shapes and patterns and forms. As I said, he was teaching in the Bauhaus at this time between 1922 and 1933, and he was teaching a beginner's class in basic design, an advanced theory class, uh, painting classes, and a workshop where he was teaching his color theory. And he also developed a new theory of form, which led to another book, Point and Line to Plane. An artist I thought I had to mention. Um, an important Russian artist, Marc Chagall. He was Russian, French of Jewish origin. In fact, um, Robert Hughes, the art critic, called him the quintessential Jewish artist of the 20th century. Although I need to say that Chagall himself saw his work not as the dream of one people, but of all humanity. Now this painting, The Fiddler, was completed in 1913 when he lived in Paris. And it shows a fiddler on, well, with one foot on the roof of his house in his hometown of Vitesk in Belarus, which was then part of the Russian Empire. His father was a herring merchant. His mother sold groceries from home. So he had a poor background. In the Russian Empire at the time, Jewish children were not allowed to attend regular schools or universities. He stayed at home, he studied Hebrew and the Bible until he was 13 when his mother bravely, because there was a danger of um, this being, um, the authorities being told, but she bribed a professor with 50 rubles to let um, Mark attend a school. It was the turning point of his artistic life and one day uh, he saw, it, it was when he saw another student drawing and it, 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 I, I should say it wasn't an art school that he went to, it was just an ordinary school to teach him uh, reading and writing, but at the school he saw another student drawing and it was the first time in his life that he'd seen anyone draw. He said it was like a vision a revelation in black and white. The concept of art, he said at that stage when he was 13, was entirely alien to him. He didn't realize you could do such things. And there was one art school in the town and the uh, artist running it admitted him free of charge. So that's how he learned to draw. In 1906, he moved to St. Petersburg, which was still then the capital of the Russian Empire. And before World War I, he traveled between St. Petersburg, Berlin and Paris, and he created his own style of modern art based on the ideas of Eastern Europe and Jewish folk culture. But as I said, his, his aim was to represent issues that concern all of humanity. He spent the war years in Soviet Belarus, his home country, and he became one of the country's most distinguished artists and a member of the um, avant-garde in Belarus. He, he actually founded the Vitesk Art College before leaving for Paris in 1923. And I'm, I've moved out of the period just for this one work you will notice I've suddenly jumped to 1950. And the reason is that I just wanted to mention uh, this, the, these two works because they are uh, relevant to London. The Watergate Theatre in Westminster, which was a small theatre club in 1950 that wanted to expand, approached Chagall to produce murals for the walls of the theatre. And he started work on two large paintings, the dance and the circus, and the Blue Circus, which were installed on the walls of the theatre. But the following year, he asked for the, if he could move them or remove them to um, put them into an exhibition in Nice. And as a replacement, he lent the theatre these two small studies. You can see they're quite small. Um, then 
one of the founders of the theatre died and the theatre passed into other hands and Chagall decided to not return the murals but to present these oil sketches to the Tate in memory of the founder of the Watergate Theatre. As a final point about uh, Chagall, Pablo Picasso, I'll give you a quote that he, he, he made, a statement he made in the 1950s. When Matisse dies, Chagall will be the only painter left who understands what colour really is. Back to 1924. Even if you've no interest in Russian art, you might recognize this powerful image. On the left is a photograph of the writer Lily Brook, oh sorry, or, or Brick, uh, taken by Alexander Rodchen Rodchenko. On the right is the poster he made from the image. The poster was made for a book publisher and she's shouting the name of the publisher, Lengiz. Lengi's books in all branches of knowledge, it says it's um, a publicity poster for the book publisher. And it was constructed as part of Lenin's new economic policy, which was a combination of private enterprise and public campaigns to improve literacy and education, because Lenin needed the working class to become literate and educated after he had overthrown the bourgeoisie, and it was um, uh, a step in the push to communism. Rodchenko understood the Soviet Union needed to beat capitalism at his own game, and uh, advertising was a very powerful tool. So he's developed these powerful posters to support um, Lenin's new economic policy. He um, was influenced, Rod Rodchenko was influenced by Cubism, Futurism, Malayevich's suprematism, and his aim as a painter was, and this is a quote, I reduced painting to its logical conclusion and exhibited three canvases, red, blue and yellow. I affirmed it's all over. In other words, he thought he'd reached the end of the possibilities of easel painting as a bourgeois practice and he continued as one of the founders of constructivism, of which more later. And his work has influenced um, graphic designers in the West, Western countries throughout the 20th and 21st century. Here's an example to show you. It's been used many times, but this one is um, a poster uh, supporting Bark for Barack Obama. It's a, a poster supporting Barack Obama's campaign. He, maybe I will, I'm just looking at the time, but I think I've got time just to talk about Lily Brick, um, because she shouldn't really be forgotten. She was a key figure in avant-garde art world, but she's been written out of history. And I just wanted to explain why she's been written out of history. She was also a society beauty at the time, hosted salons of artists. Every avant-garde artist of the period knew her and she was married to an aesthetic theorist and had an affair with a famous Russian poet called Vladimir Mayakovsky, who committed suicide when the affair ended. Now, Mayakovsky supported Lenin, but a lot of his work was controversial and um, against the state. But Brick bravely wrote to Stalin in 1935, later, supporting Mayakovsky and Stalin, we don't know why, Stalin wrote across her letter, Mayakovsky is the best and most talented poet in our Soviet epoch. The result was startling. He was hailed as a hero. The town where he was born was renamed Mayakovsky. His controversial work was all destroyed and Brick's name was removed from all of his biographies, and she was even airbrushed out of photographs showing her with the Soviet poet. And 
her name, her face remains one of the most famous this on this influential po poster, but her, her identity and what she did at the time has been completely erased. One more um, work by Alexander Rodchenko, because he was one of the great photographers, I think, of the 20th century. Um, in 1928, he was charged with um, formalism uh, at the expense of subject at, his time, at the time when party guidelines were insisting on socialist realism. Um, he concentrated on sports photography, parades, and works like this, powerful works of um, concentrating on form. He did return to painting in the 1930s and produced abstract expressionist works and, and died in Moscow in 1956. Malevich, Kazimir Malevich was born in the Ukraine to Polish parents. And he, when he visited France later, he stated his, po his um, nationality is Polish. Um, he's, he's claimed by the Russians, by the Ukrainians, um, but he, he stated his nationality was Polish. In 1904, when his father died, he moved to Moscow and studied at the Moscow School of Painting from 1904 to 1910. He worked with Vladimir Tatlin that we'll see later. Um, he was influenced by Goncharova. He quickly assimilated all of the movements, Impressionism, Symbolism, Fauvism, Cubism. And in 1915, he published his manifesto from Cubism to Suprematism. And he gradually simplified his style and simplified it and simplified it until it culminated in his first black square, which you can see exhibited here in an exhibition entitled The Last Futurist Exhibition 0 0.1 in St. Petersburg in 1915, or, or Petrograd as it was then called. As you can see, his work consisted of geometric forms. Some of those works have started to get more complex. You can see on the walls here, his black square. And as I've said before, when he first painted the cracks are just age, when he first represented it, it was entirely flat black. Was the most radical abstract painting created so far and crossed, quote, what he called an uncrossable line between old art and new art. And you can see it exhibited high up in the corner in a position that religious icons were normally uh, held, uh, uh, hung in many Russian homes. Uh, this is another work. Let your eyes just adjust. There's a white, it's white on white, um, a very uh, modern concept or ahead of its time. It's called white on white a barely differentiated off-white square uh, would take his ideas of abstraction to their logical conclusion. But then he started to build up from this basis of the having reached ground zero, if you like, he started to build. He wrote books describing his theories from cubism and futurism to suprematism. And um, this work is, which is in the Tate, Oh, I haven't got it there. This is actually this is in the Tate uh, called Dynamic Suprematism. And I don't know whether you can see, well, you can certainly see in the original that um, it's carefully constructed. He used, you can see pencil marks where he was carefully working out where and how to position these um, abstract forms. There are no horizontals or verticals. You'll notice everything is placed on a diagonal, which gives it a form of this feeling of instability and, and action of almost of movement. And it's carefully balanced in that way. He was trying to get away from what he called, quote, the dead weight of the material world. He was influenced again by theosophy and the spiritual realm. And he believed that this could lead to peace, harmony, and a utopian society. He regarded copying 
nature as like a thief, in his words, like a thief being enraptured by his leg irons. He thought that to produce these pure paintings inspired purely by feeling, which was the aim of suprematism, it really means art inspired by feeling rather than representation of the of the world. He called um, all previous art, quotes, bits of nature, Madonnas and shameless nudes. And he rejected it all. But um, his work was seen by the Communist Party as rife with counter-revolutionary sermonizing and artistic debauchery because the Soviet Union was then promoting a propagandist style of art called Soviet socialist realism. And a form of art that, of course, Malevich had spent his whole life repudiating. I said I'd come on to Vladimir Tatlin. This is his monument to the Third International, also called Tatlin's Tower. Um, Tatlin and Malevich were two of the most important figures in Soviet avant-garde art. And uh, although from 1915, perhaps Rodchenko as the founder of the constructivist movement. But Tatlin's Tower, this is um, a model. It was going to be enormous, a third taller than the Eiffel Tower, made of glass, iron and steel. And if you look carefully inside it, there are three blocks, three, three in fact, buildings which would have rotated at different speeds. The first one, uh, which was intended, which is a cube once a year. The second one, a pyramid once a month and the third one a cylinder once a day. And the entire building was to house the Comitern, which was um, a Russian organization that would promote world communism. But financial and practical reasons meant the tower was never built, but the, um, this, this model, this idea has been very influential. In fact, I, I saw a, uh, a model of it, um, when I attended the, when I went to the, um, the, the gallery at the University of East Anglia. Uh, Tatlin was a Russian and architect, stage designer and painter born in Moscow. His father was a hereditary nobleman, uh, but also a mechanical engineer, so a worker on the railways. Now Tatlin failed to get into the Moscow School of Painting and was supported in his art by his father and when his father died he had to get a job so he worked as a merchant seaman traveled around the black sea traveled to egypt and entered art school exhibited in moscow and st petersburg settled in moscow as an icon painter and then in 1919 is when he became famous for designing this tower tatlin's tower was sort of the the making of him and he was regarded as one of the founders of soviet post-revolutionary constructivist art, although he didn't actually regard himself as a constructivist. And, and just to explain, constructivism was rejection of conventional art, rejection of all spiritual associations, and, and in this Tatlin and Malevich broke with each other because Malevich was fundamentally believed in these spiritual associations. Constructivism was art constructed for a practical and social purpose based on scientific and engineering laws. It combined art and architecture and art and engineering, and it had an enormous influence on um, the Bauhaus um, design movement. This is um, L. Lizitsky, his full name, was Lazar Markovich Lizitsky, but it's um, he, he called himself L. Lizitsky. And he designed this propaganda poster called Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge. And in case you haven't picked up the, the reference, it's to the Bolshevik Red Army overcoming the anti-communist white Russians 
and just to um, explain that I, I've translated the words for you. Wedge, red, beat, whites. Uh, it was designed to support the efforts of the Red Army and um, it's using very strong basic geometric shapes to create a, this powerful poster that um, shaped the aesthetics at this time of a lot of Soviet Russian art. He was a pioneer, Lizitsky, in design, architecture, typography, and even installation art. And he experimented with lots of new technologies and media. And his, his work, like this one, uh, helped define 20th century uh, modern graphic design. He's been uh, very influential. He was um, building on the philosophy of Malayevich and suprematism, um, but rejecting the spiritual and working with the constructivists to advance Soviet society as they saw it at this, at this time, 1920. Uh, everything was um, shortly about to change when Stalin came into power. He wrote, art can no longer merely be a mirror, it must act as the organizer of the people's consciousness. Alexander De Necker was a um, Soviet Russian painter, graphics artist and sculptor. He is regarded as one of the most important Russian modernist figurative painters of the first half of the 20th century. And I think this is remarkably modern uh, looking representation. It's textile workers in a factory, but to me, they, um, they look almost like, like robots. It was painted in 1927 when Stalin required uh, Soviet realism was coming into force. And uh, this is a sort of um, a borderline, but it is um, uh, celebrating textile workers and it is realistic. And a lot of Soviet realistic art was um, uh, semi-abstracted. De Necker was born in Kursk and studied at art college. And um, he's um, exhibited widely. He, he's in his mosaics, because um, he also produced murals, his mosaics can be seen at one of the metro stations in Moscow called um, Mayakovkaya. I think that's how you pronounce it, Mayakovkaya metro station in Moscow. And this is a, a small detail. This is free fall of the parachuter. And now we come on to, um, in the last um, uh, 20 minutes, the last uh, on to Soviet uh, realism and leave, leaving behind modern art. We see here, um, celebration of the the worker. Uh, this um, was the USSR pavilion in 1937, and the the sculpture in Vilnius, Lithuania, was um, it, it was originally there um, in 19, in 2015. The statue was actually removed, but so this is a photograph before it was removed. Now, Stalin uh, was in office from 1922 till 1953, and he came into power as the overall leader on Lenin's death in 1924. And the only form of art he allowed, which he brought about fairly quickly, was socialist realism. Abstract art was banned as bourgeois, and no foreign art was shown for at least 30 years. Many artists were denounced and executed, and many fled the country, as I've already uh, given you examples. Socialist realism was a style, it was uh, to some extent idealized, but realistic art, and it was the official style in Russia between 1932, uh, when it became formally the only way you're allowed to paint, uh, till 1988, and other socialist countries after World War II. There was um, no 
uh, modern art movement, although in the 1960s there was an unofficial modern art movement in Moscow of some, but it was still dangerous even then to practice modern art. And there was no real modern art movement in Russia till the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. It, it's the, the idea of socialist realism was to glorify the depiction of communist values and the emancipation of the proletariat. This is another, this is a well-known um, piece um, by uh, Boris Vladimirsky, Roses for Stalin. It's a later work, you can see 1949, showing Soviet realism in painting as it was still um, uh, followed. A group of children are giving Joseph Stalin a bunch of roses, showing their love for him. It was um, painted a year before uh, Vladimirsky's death and four years before Stalin's death. It's it's pure propaganda, of course, but it's probably um, Vladimirsky's best known work. It's, very, it's a well-known work in Russia, which is why I'm showing it. But I wanted to finish with um, more uh, detail about what happened after the period. I sort of extended the period because I felt uh, when I was writing this talk that I needed to, to sort of finish off the talk with um, uh, the consequences Stalin was born into a poor family in what's now Georgia. He went on to edit the party's newspaper, Pravda, ironically called Pravda Truth. He raised funds for Vladimir Lenin's Bolshevik faction via robberies, kidnappings, protection rackets. He was arrested and sent to Siberia, but escaped. And he was arrested again and escaped um, many times. He was very tough. He was street smart. He was basically um, a gangster. Now, after he, see, he came to power, he created, um, or, or Lenin had created a one party state that Stalin took over. I wanted to end with a um, what is admittedly a sad tale, but it ends in black comedy. From 1930, the Soviet Union published this um, journal called USS USSR in Construction. And it was printed in Russian, French, English, and German, and later Spanish. Its purpose was to promote the Soviet Union as a leading agricultural and industrial nation. And it was read in Britain, by communist idealists who used it to show the successes of the Soviet Union. From the 1920s, Stalin had imposed a centralized command economy based on a series of five year plans, which continued until the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. These plans uh, were a central control with impossible targets, and these targets led to uh, one could imagine, to lying and exaggeration. We're told in this issue, it's a bit difficult to read the fine print, but it says how a state farm called Cuba was congratulated personally by Stalin and for exceeding its targets. We are told how it's be it beat every target for cereal, milk, the size of pig litters, lambs per ewe, wool per sheep, every year for the previous five years believe it if you will. The reality was a disaster. Well, worse than disaster, it led to this severe disruption of food production and famines, particularly 1932-33, the death of five to seven million people. The horror of what happened was witnessed by many Western visitors who were invited to the Soviet Union, but it seems they largely ignored it on their return. One exception, which I'll mention, was the author Arthur, Arthur Kerstler, who visited the Soviet Union, believing that the Soviet Union embodied a sort of semi-mystical vision of the future, that is, until he traveled to the Ukraine 
and he described in his book The Invisible Writing how he saw out of the train window at every station, this is a quote from the book, infants pitiful and terrifying with limbs like sticks, puffed bellies, big cadaverous heads lolling on thin necks. I had arrived unsuspecting at the peak of the famine of 1932-33, which had depopulated entire districts and claimed several million victims. Now, later to eradicate the so-called enemies of the working class, Stalin instituted what he called the Great Purge in which over a million were imprisoned and at least 700,000 were executed between about 1934 and 1939. In by 1937, he had complete personal control of the party and the state. And the total number of deaths is unknown, but one estimate made after historians looked at the archives after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, calculated nine million deaths, including six million deliberate killings. And this figure excludes the five to seven million deaths I just mentioned during the mostly Ukrainian famine, uh, which incidentally, the Ukrainian famine, 26 countries have classified as genocide uh, that is intentional. Finally, if you haven't seen it, I recommend the black comedy, The Death of Stalin by Armando Iannucci, which was released in 2017. Now, in 1953, this, that is, um, well, in 1953, Stalin organized the arrest and show trial of doctors in Moscow based on their alleged poisoning of patients. He didn't, Stalin didn't trust doctors, and many of the doctors in Moscow were Jewish. And Stalin um, believed that there was a, a Jewish plot to overthrow the state. And we now know that he planned to transport all of the Soviet Union's two million Jews to a specially built, and, and it has been seen, it was built, vast Siberian gulag to hold and massacre all of the Soviet Union's two million Jews. And in order to um, provide uh, justification for this, he held a show trial of Jewish doctors in Moscow um, for allegedly poisoning patients, so-called doctor's plot. And this arrest resulted in the arrest, torture and death of all the Jewish and many non-Jewish doctors in Moscow and other, the other doctors, the remaining doctors left the city. So the film, The Death of Stalin, tells the true story of how Stalin suffered a severe stroke and became paralyzed. His guards didn't dare enter his room, although they heard noises. And Stalin was only found the next morning when his housekeeper came in to clean. No one knew what to do. He was still alive, but paralyzed. There were no competent doctors left in Moscow. And as a result, as the film shows you, they brought in some incompetent doctors who didn't know what to say. They were too afraid to say anything in case he came back to life and Stalin died. And uh, as a, I won't tell you the rest of the plot of the film, but um, as a final comment on art in Russia today, the film was banned. 